Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Brief Podcast. We've renamed this video podcast, and more than ever, we're hoping to bring you context, perspective, and analysis that will give you a better understanding of global issues. I'm your host, Jim Clancy. The war in Gaza goes on, the death toll surpasses 30,000, mostly civilians and mostly women and children. Negotiations to free more than 100 Israeli hostages are stalled. Hunger stalks more than 2 million Palestinians trapped there. Prime Minister Netanyahu openly defies President Biden's calls for restraint. And now more than ever, the war in Gaza is becoming a domestic U.S. policy concern because of the upcoming 2024 presidential election. Well, joining us now to discuss all of this is David Rothkopf, a former Clinton administration official, a longtime analyst of national security and international affairs, who hosts his own highly successful podcast, Deep State Radio. Hello and welcome, David. Pleasure to be here. David, how much has Gaza really upended everyone's plans? The Israelis' plans, the Palestinians, as well as the Biden administration? Well, I, you know, I, I think there was uh, an expectation um, early in the Biden administration that it could extricate itself from the Middle East, from the forever wars, uh, by managing the exit from Afghanistan. Um, and even after that took place with some um, bumps in the road, some, some unfortunate developments, uh, they thought they could shift their focus to the Indo-Pacific region uh, and to other global priorities. Uh, but clearly, it's a little bit like that scene in The Godfather, where you know, um, uh, you know, Michael Corleone says essentially, you know, I keep trying to get away, and it keeps drawing me back in. Um, the Middle East does that, uh, and then in the wake of October seventh, which was a horrific uh, event and the worst day in Israeli history, as the Israelis um, note. Um, I think there was a, an expectation that perhaps this crisis could be managed um, as past crises have been managed so that it might last days or weeks um, and that it might be difficult for days or weeks, um, but that it would be containable and that you know people would be able to put it behind them. Uh, of course, that's not how it has played out the 31,000 and growing number of, of dead in Gaza, the 70,000 injured in Gaza, the complete destruction of Gaza, uh, and now half a million people uh, living uh, with the threat of famine have made it one of the worst uh, humanitarian catastrophes uh, uh, in, in Middle East history, have made it also... Um, uh, an, an open wound for which there is no near-term solution in the offing. And that's in large part due to the fact that the United States uh, and Israel have different views and have drifted apart. Um, uh, and uh, obviously Hamas and Israel have different views. Regional players have different views. Uh, the Palestinian Authority and the Israelis have different views. And we've made no material progress in, in bridging any of those divisions uh, in the course of the past five months. Prime Minister Netanyahu has been adamant he is going for victory over Hamas. Is that a fool's errand to think that you can stop a movement like this that's born uh, of refugees, that's born of decades and decades of impunity for one side as it continues to occupy the other? Well, uh, first of all, I think the majority of Israelis in recent polls have indicated that they don't think that the initial goal of uh, uh, Netanyahu to eliminate Hamas is an achievable goal. And of course, it's not an achievable goal. Perhaps there were 30 or 40,000 people in Hamas. They can't identify them all. They can't get to them all. Uh, they're not going to eliminate them. Uh, uh, defeating Hamas, that's, a, that's another issue. Could you decapitate it? Uh, could you dis, uh, you know, uh, uh, eliminate its sources of, of power, including the funding that the Israelis had actually helped uh, facilitate? 
yeah, you, you, you could do that. You could dr defeat it. You could dramatically weaken it. Um, but that has not been their goal to date. Then compounding this problem is that, you know, it's been the U.S. experience and the experience of others who've fought in similar situations that if you go in and you produce a lot of civilian deaths, uh, the result will be uh, the creation of new uh, extremists. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is something that I, I think can be expected for a long time to come. Indeed, the U.S. Uh, Director of Central Intelligence, Bill Burns, yesterday in congressional testimony suggested that we might see generations of extremists produced uh, by the horrors of this conflict. When we look at it, and there's no way to look away, when we look at it and see this utter toll of civilian deaths, there's more and more pressure piling up on Joe Biden to do something. He's tried to use strong language, language behind the scenes, harsh rhetoric. Nothing's working. Even his latest call for a red line saying that Israel must refrain from an assault on Rafah, one of the last refuges of the people who fled from other parts of Gaza, even that red line that the president laid down was openly defied by Mr. Netanyahu uh, shortly after he uttered it. Uh, look, I, you know, I, I think um, the reaction that President Biden had on October 7th to a thousand people being brutally murdered, savagely murdered, done so in a in a in a, in a uh, unprovoked and very visible way. Uh, was the reaction that any U.S. president would have had, which is we are going to stand by and support Israel. Um, I think the problem was that in the days that followed, the United States sent a message to the Israelis, uh, including explicitly from Biden, that we were going to provide unconditional support, essentially that they could do whatever they wanted. Um, it was apparent to many observers that that would be a mistake, that Netanyahu was not trustworthy uh, under any even the best of circumstances. But here Netanyahu uh, had m multiple motives, not just revenge for going into Gaza as he did. He also has political crisis and he needed this war to sort of rescue him and divert attention away from him. And the result was um, that you had this absolutely brutal, uh, I believe, war crime laden uh, uh, intervention into Gaza um, and the United States at first felt that by not publicly criticizing the Israelis, but trying to influence them behind the scenes, particularly on issues like humanitarian aid, uh, that they would have more leverage. That proved to be untrue. Netanyahu was not listening to them. He didn't care. The extremists in his cabinet, Ben Gavir, Smotrich, and the others, um, uh, were saying things that were uh, not just uh, uh, contrary to U.S. policy, but antithetical to U.S. policy, ranging from calls for uh, um, ethnic cleansing to um, even more brutality. Um, and the U.S. grew more and more frustrated. And so starting in December, you started to see more public displays of the gap between the United States and, 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 and Israel on a number of policy issues. And when that didn't produce more leverage, um, in in recent days, uh, as the threat of famine and, and, and much higher death tolls have, have gone up, you've now started to see even another change in the U.S. tactics. And now the U.S. is essentially on both sides in this war. We're providing airdrops into Gaza. We're building a port to bring food into Gaza. We are trying to aid um, the Gazans in a way that the Israelis have not, and indeed that the Israelis have uh, impeded from other sources. Um, and uh, at the same time, Biden did make this red line comment, which cuts to the core issue of will the United States withhold uh, military aid from the Israelis. And in this particular case, um, uh, he tried to walk it back a little bit after he said it, but he only walked it back part way. He said, we would continue to support the Israelis defensively, like with providing um, uh, ammunition for the Iron Dome uh, defensive systems. 
but that we would consider withholding military aid of other sorts. Uh, that does have some teeth. Uh, and there was a report late yesterday in Politico with multiple sources uh, that suggested that indeed that's what the United States is thinking about now. If the Israelis go into Rafa, and as you pointed out, Netanyahu said, you know, he didn't care about the red line, that's what he's going to do, where there are over a million people jammed in and casualties, civilian casualties would be very high, the United States has now begun to consider withholding uh, uh, vital military aid from the Israelis. We should have done that a long time ago. Should have done it a long time ago. And that's what some of the critics have been saying, that across decades, Israel has been shown impunity. When it was up for criticism for, before the United Nations Security Council, the U.S. would always step in and veto the resolution. And it has been conditioned that this just isn't going to ha happen. What's different now that makes you think that there's even a possibility that Biden would take that step? Because it's going to invite a response from his political opponents at home, isn't it? Well, it is. I mean, you know, um, Donald Trump, um, you know, and it's important to remember who his opponents are every time you're, you know, sort of one is laying into Biden for criticism on this thing or anything. Donald Trump's response to what should be done in Gaza is to, Gaza is to finish the job. But Donald Trump would undoubtedly give a much greater blank check and greater amount of support to Netanyahu. And Netanyahu knows it. Netanyahu is trying to get, um, uh, you know, the kind of traction that would enable him to remain in power until Trump possibly could win because he thinks that would work to his advantage. Um, Biden is dealing with essentially um, more forces than just this crisis. He's also dealing with a generational shift. He is of a generation that remembers Israel as the David fighting the Goliath of the Arab nations, Israel as the country that made the desert green. Uh, of course, starting in the early 1980s, uh, Israel became seen as the strongest power in the region and in, in places like Lebanon flexed its muscle in very brutal ways and was seen as a, as a bully. Uh, and so people 20, 30 years younger than Biden have a different view. And the younger generation in the United States, and this I think is really substantial, they don't have any of the natural affinity for um, uh, Israel that the United States has had in the past. They don't remember the Cold War. They don't remember Israel as a vital ally in a region that was filled with countries that were closely tied to the Soviet Union. Uh, they don't remember a period in which the United States was not the leading energy producer in the world in which we were dependent on the Middle East. So Israel's strategic value to them has, has, is, has declined from what it was for other generations, while at the same time, uh, they see the brutality of Israel. And so, you know, the under 35 generation has absolutely no patience um, uh, uh, for the Israelis. And I believe one of the lasting consequences of this conflict um, will be um, a, 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 a sea change in U.S.-Israel policy, and it will not be the kind of blank check special relationship that it was in the past. Speaking of blank checks, over the years, some 34 years, Joe Biden has received, what, five and a half million dollars from AIPAC. Now, a group of progressives within the Democratic Party are saying, all candidates don't take any donations from APAC. This would be unprecedented. And not only APAC, all of the other, you know, PACs that are associated uh, with pro-Israeli uh, stands, stands that some people see as all pro Likud, all pro the settler movement. And they want to just divest themselves of that. And they want the administration and the Democratic Party to follow it. Well, look, I mean, I think one of the problems in this moment is that it's fraught in multiple ways. Obviously, the attack on, on October 7th, which was horrific, has produced a, a, a revulsion uh, and, 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 a, and a kind of uh, natural uh, impulse to, uh, you know, come together and, uh, 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 you know, advance what they see as the interests of Israel among some pro-Israeli groups. Um, and um, the Israeli response to the attack 
uh, has had, you know, sort of the counter effect with other groups that see it as repellent. Um, uh, you know, I think it's really important at a time like this to be very careful about how we characterize positions. So, um, uh, you know, groups like APAC say they're pro-Israel, when actually, as you say, they're pro-Likud, they're pro-Israel's right wing. And mm-hmm. groups like APAC and people associated with them say that people who are critical of Netanyahu are anti-Israel or worse, anti-Semitic, when in fact they're anti the positions of one extremist sect in political, in Israeli politics. Um, and, and so is it natural that some groups draw a distinction and say, no, the APAC definitions don't work for us anymore. We want to be supportive of Israel. But frankly, we don't think being supportive of Netanyahu policies is supportive of Israel. This is something that Biden himself said the other day. What Netanyahu is doing, what the extreme right has done in Gaza, is put Israel at much greater risk, has created many new security threats, has not reduced the risk of another October 7th. And um, uh, so actually being supportive of the, the Likud or the extreme right in Israel is actually anti-Israel. Uh, similarly, there are many people, I've, you know, I am a, a son of a, a Holocaust survivor. Most of my father's family was killed in the Holocaust. Um, and I have been critical of the Netanyahu government and have been accused by prominent people in the uh, sort of uh, traditional uh, uh, pro-Israel establishment community of being anti-Semitic, which is, you know, I'm Jewish. My family's Jewish. They, you know, um, uh, you know, it's I, I couldn't be farther from the truth. But emotions are running very, very high, um, and people are using charged phrases to achieve their political objective uh, without any regard for the underlying truth that's associated with it. Uh, APEC is no longer a constructive, nonpartisan. Uh, player in U.S. political life, if it ever was. But it is certainly not now. It is now an arm of the Republican Party, an arm of the Israeli right, and frankly, uh, a supporter of a broader global ethno-nationalist right-wing movement that includes Putin, Orban, Modi, Bolsonaro, Netanyahu, Erdogan, etc. Um, uh, there are other alternatives uh, that better represent the views of Americans uh, who would like to be supportive of Israel, but do so in a responsible way. Uh, and I think the movement among some progressives is to say, let's refocus on those groups, J Street and other kinds of groups. Um, uh, and, and let's recognize this, you know, for what it is, you know, let's not let, you know, some people claim you know, much in the same way that MAGA claims that they have the interests of America at heart. They don't. Um, uh, let's not let some people claim the cloak of being supportive of Israel or the Israeli people or the Jewish people when that, in fact, is not what their role is. There are tens upon tens of thousands of Israelis who regularly take to the streets demanding an end of Prime Minister Netanyahu's control over the government. They want to change. And they don't think we're going to see a real solution in Gaza until we get that change. Well, I mean, it's absolutely true. I, Netanyahu um, is a crook. He's a, a desperate guy. He has no interest in democracy. He was trying to undermine the judiciary of uh, Israel. Uh, it produced prior to October 7th, 40 plus weeks of demonstrations of hundreds of thousands of Israelis, people who had not been politically active before saying, no, this guy's got to be stopped. He is a threat to our democracy in much the same way many Americans see Trump, his buddy, as a threat to American democracy. Again, this right-wing movement uh, worldwide is an authoritarian movement um, uh, that plays off of sort of ethnic uh, solidarity and anti-globalization in order to achieve power that really serves small groups of oligarchs in each of these societies. 
But having said that, um, I you know it is uh, my sense that uh, uh, you know Netanyahu has shifted and he's now trying to survive uh, using the war as a lever to survive. Uh, he, his approval rating at different times during this war has been incredibly low, four percent in November. Um, uh, in the low double digits um, most of the time ever since, which suggests that as the war comes to a close, if there were an election, he would lose. Uh, I think what's salient for people who would like to see peace in this situation is that there is no Israeli candidate who embraces a two-state solution, which is an essential precondition to peace. There is no Israeli candidate uh, who is likely to win, that is, um, who uh, uh, supports the empowerment of the Palestinians, wants to truly stop the settlers in the West Bank, uh, wants to uh, restore to the Palestinians the kind of territory that they need in order to have uh, any chance of uh, self-determination and, and viability as an uh, independent political entity. Uh, and so even if you get past Netanyahu, you're still going to have some serious problems here. And I think that's why this is going to be an open wound uh, in the region for a long, long time to come. Well, that's also why it's critical for somebody to have a plan for what to do when it does come to some kind of a, a conclusion. Now, Israel has used this as an opportunity to uh, undermine, eliminate UNRWA. Uh, the UN Refugee Agency for the Palestinians, specifically for the Palestinians. That's why it was created. Uh, Netanyahu wants to do away with it. Some Western countries, in a knee-jerk reaction, heard allegations that were made against UNRWA staff and immediately canceled aid. The U.S. was among them. And now it's surfacing that a lot of the evidence that the IDF was able to muster is incredible. It, it, it doesn't make the case. But we see these things being dismantled while nothing is being built up to put in its place. Uh, Joe Biden's talking about recognizing a Palestinian state, but down the road, much like Oslo promised something down the road. And the voters in Michigan, the voters, uh, progressives in other places are saying, we're not buying this again. We're not going for a pig and a poke. And Biden's got to somehow overcome that. You walk the halls of Washington and I, I think you're well tuned in uh, to what the chatter really is. How concerned is the Democratic Party? Well, I, I mean, I, you know, there are political considerations here. I do think good, uh, a lot of Democrats are concerned by uh, some groups that have been alienated by this, notably um, Arab American, Muslim Americans in uh, places uh, like Michigan. Um, but there are greater, greater considerations here, and the greater considerations... Uh, have to do with U.S. national interests. Uh, the vice president in December in uh, Dubai began to sketch out um, uh, what seems to me to be a, a, a you know a commonsensical approach to the day after, uh, and that's got a few key components. One key component is Hamas is gone. Another key component is that the Palestinian Authority is. Uh, 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 revitalized, that it's uh, superannuated current leaders are replaced by new leaders because you need to have some political entity representing the Palestinians. Uh, another is that the Netanyahu government's going to have to go. And at that point, you're going to have to have a discussion where, first of all, you focus on rebuilding, but you focus on rebuilding in the context of establishing a Palestinian political entity that can become a Palestinian political uh, state. To do that, you're going to need the support of regional players. Uh, and all those regional players have said much in the same tone that you just used a moment ago, we're not playing this game again. Until it's clear that we can achieve something like a, um, uh, 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 a viable Palestinian state, we are absolutely not um, going to um, uh, support this. So we need to persuade them to support it because it's going to cost tens and tens of billions of dollars. Gaza is gone. It is destroyed. It does not exist anymore. It can not sustain life 
uh, I think that the other component of this, though, is that the United States is going to have to change its view on the international community uh, and international institutions and support them in some role. You can't leave Gaza to the Israelis, who have clearly demonstrated that they do not have in uh, the interests of the Palestinian people at heart. Um, and I think, you know, the example you give of UNRWA is a, in a, is a good one. Um, uh, the aid workers, the aid people, the professionals I know, uh, point out that UNRWA, if whatever its defects, is the only mechanism for dealing with the humanitarian crisis in uh, Gaza. Um, and, uh, you know, the Israelis at the beginning of this war said, well, we've identified 12 Palestinians uh, in UNRWA who worked with Hamas. Uh, as the war progressed in their desire, which has long existed to get rid of UNRWA, they said, no, we now believe there are 30 Palestinians. There are 12,000 people in UNRWA. This is a ridiculous position. The United States has supported this position. It is the wrong uh, position. You can fix UNRWA, but you can't eliminate UNRWA in the middle of a famine when they're the only mechanism that can help you fight that famine. So, uh, we've got to stop with the, the nonsense on that. We've got to stop with, uh, you know, reflexively taking the Israeli position in the United Nations uh, when it is not in our interest to do so. Israel is making the region less safe. Uh, Israel's government is acting in a way that is not in the interest of the Israeli people or the American people or the Palestinian people or the other people of the region. Uh, and we need to use every tool that we've got to put pressure on them to change their policies. And we must not support a continuation of policies that have been designed for decades to weaken the Palestinians, to produce division among the Palestinians. Um, it's why Netanyahu, for example, supported uh, Hamas for a long time back through the back door because they thought this was produce a division within the Palestinians. All that's got to change. And, uh, 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 I, you know, I don't think it's all going to change as quickly as it should. Uh, but it, if it does not change, we will not have a solution to this crisis. Is there evidence there in Washington that former President Trump is trying to establish some lines of communication uh, with Prime Minister Netanyahu? After all, they share a lot of the same problems. They have a lot in common. Two men have a lot in common. They're both corrupt. They're both facing uh, uh, legal troubles. Neither of them is a particularly big fan of democracy. Both of them are pretty big fans of Vladimir Putin and Viktor Orban and the rest of the autocrat gang um, uh, that are pushing this ethno-nationalist formula, which is their formula, which is to say we, whoever we are, is a group um, of uh, united people who oppose the dilution of our societies, typically by groups that are uh, brown or, uh, you know, otherwise can be characterized uh, as the other. In India, it's, it's for example, uh, Muslims. Uh, it often involves actually anger at Muslims. In Russia, it does. In U uh, Hungary, it does. In Israel, it does. And in the United States, that it does. Um, and so, you know, Netanyahu and Trump are fellow travelers. And uh, uh, just as Vladimir Putin would like to see Donald Trump as president, because he, you know, as Orban said, would not support, you know, Ukraine at all. Um, uh, Netanyahu would like to see it as well. Um, uh, the question is whether Netanyahu survives as prime minister long enough uh, to get to a Trump administration. I don't think he will for two reasons. I think at some point later this year, there'll be an election, he'll lose. Uh, and I think Trump's going to lose. But, but you know, he, he certainly hoping against hope. That's not the scenario. A final question, American voters. Some see backing away from Joe Biden, depriving him of their vote as the only way to really change how Palestinians are treated by successive administrations. But as you noted, that poses one hell of a risk. Not a hell of a risk. It's insane. It's, a, it's an absolutely insane position. It's insane because Trump has said he will be more likely to do more things that are bad. He's the author of the Muslim ban. He wants to institute a new Muslim ban the day that he comes into power. He is blank check for Putin. He is blank check for Netanyahu. He will support 
um, uh, damage done by those actors against uh, uh, you know, you know, Palestinians against the Ukrainians against other groups, um, uh, much more vigorously than Biden would. Biden is is grappling with a variety of issues, and you know the situation in which he's found himself is extremely difficult. Israel is an ally. Israel was attacked. The United States historically has supported that kind of an attack. How do you in a how do you pivot from the way you feel on October 7th to the way that you feel on October 9th, 10th, 11th, as Israel then starts pointing itself in the direction of Gaza. Uh, what Biden tried to do is use behind the scenes pressure to achieve some goals. He was naive in thinking he could achieve them. He was unsuccessful in achieving them. But throughout the course of this conflict, as he has seen he has been unsuccessful, he's also tried to learn from the experience and to get better. Joe Biden, uh, will produce a much better outcome in these things for people who care about them than Donald Trump will. But also, Joe Biden um, is a the only bulwark, the only choice against Donald Trump who will undermine democracy in the United States of America. Donald Trump has promised to be a dictator from day one. Donald Trump who's promised to gut the U.S. administration of uh, all Politi uh, all appointees in the government, all the career people in the government who do not, you know, swear loyalty oath to him. Donald Trump, who has said that he is going to put his enemies into prisons. Donald Trump, who said he's going to create concentration camps for immigrants in the United States. Make no mistake about it. If you want the United States to be an active participant in international affairs that advocates for anything like the values you may have, um, it's not even a choice. You must not only oppose Trump, you must not only vote for Biden, you must work for Biden, because we are months away from a turn of events that nobody could have imagined when I was growing up, which is the United States actually stopping to be a democracy, the United States stopping to be a leading international player, the United States turning into an authoritarian police state run by a bunch of people who are at their heart and repeatedly reveal this racists, uh, misogynists, uh, anti-Semites, anti-Muslim, um, anti-rule of law, this is this is this is not a choice. You 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 don't like Biden policies. Protest them. Uh, you don't like Biden policies. Uh, the only way you're going to have any influence over what U.S. policies are is if Biden gets reelected. So s come up with a good strategy to influence him after he gets reelected. But if you do anything to reduce the likelihood that he is elected, you will lose influence. You will see a much worse solution uh, and you'll be doing lasting damage, not just to the United States, but to the entire international community, which is dependent on the United States um, uh, in, 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 in good times and bad to at least aspire to be an advocate for the kind of values that we talk about in the United States. David Rothkopf, we're going to leave it there. I really appreciate you taking the time to join us here on The Brief Podcast. And I urge everyone to tune in Deep State Radio to listen to more of David's commentary there. David, again, thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for inviting me. And thank all of you for being with us. Be sure to like and follow The Brief Podcast on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and explore some of our other episodes on international affairs. But for now, I'm Jim Clancy.